Coronavirus cases in Korea, South Korea, and Japan are climbing strongly. And as well, institutions, World Health Institutions, are in danger of losing the faith and trust they need to operate. Hello, everyone. This is Chris Martinson. I'm here with your COVID-19 update for February 20th. 2020, and I've titled this one The Fourth Turning, and that will make sense in just a minute. But first, the numbers. So let's look here. China, uh, you know, again, who knows what we can make of these cases, but um, uh, these case numbers, they all seem very low to me. But at any rate, the new cases, this is a really startlingly low number being reported out of China. This is all China, including the Hubei province. That's a, the lowest number we've seen in a while. So that could indicate, well, it does indicate the extent to which their containment efforts are working. And they've had to get fairly draconian, and they've had to do a variety of things which have been uh, seem anti-humanistic. But honestly, the only way you can get the r naught below one with something this virulent is you're going to have to get people to get into isolation and simply not contact each other. That's the way you go about it. Uh, the other news out of China, the Hubei province, which includes a lot of critical manufacturing, just announced that instead of people going back to work today, which was the target, they've extended that out to March 11th. So what's that? That's uh, 19 more days from now. Um, That's a a really long ways out. So they know something we don't know. I'm going to go with that particular action. The Diamond Princess, only, only 13 more cases. Uh, That's a sharp decline from prior days. Now we're up to two deaths and 27 in serious or critical condition over here. That's going to be climbing because, of course, there's a lag involved in many of these people here who are infected, got infected in the past week or so. It's going to take them a while to progress all the way out to the serious or critical stage. But South Korea has now entered and jumped really into the third position. 46 new cases, many of those coming from a single case, a single woman who was not just a super spreader, but a superior spreader. Uh, Just astonishing uh, what this one person managed to do. And um, Japan still very much has has an issue. We'll be talking more about Japan coming along. Singapore seems to have a handle on this at this point, just one case there. Hong Kong starting to get a couple other cases. And I think this chart is missing one more that was just announced, which was a policeman. Going down the list a little bit, um, puzzlingly, the United States dropped back to 15 cases. You remember yesterday was up in the 20s, I think 28 on yesterday's. I forget where it was exactly, but it was up way over this number. Uh, and I can't, for the life of me, begin to understand what that is. And we'll talk about that in just a second. But Iran, we've seen um, videos coming out that looks like they've taken the city of Qom, Q-O-M, and put that on lockdown. And now they have more cases. And they reported yesterday two cases, two deaths. Again, we noted that as suspicious. So we'll keep an eye on that. But it looks like Iran now has a problem, too. So uh, over here from uh, some uh, somebody from... Uh, representative from NucleusWealth.com managed to send me links to charts. I found them really fascinating and really well done. So you can check out those charts here. Great charts. So looking here at total cases for rest of world, uh, and this separates them into total rest of world in those cases that were caught outside China. And once they're outside China, that means you have the possibility that the disease is endemic. Endemic in, epide- in epidemiology, an infection is said to be endemic in a population When that infection is constantly maintained at some level in a geographic area without external inputs, for example, chickenpox is endemic in the UK, but malaria is not. So if these cases were caught outside China, that means that they didn't have that external input from China. So you see how these two lines are tracking each other very closely. And it just says that this line right here tells you that we have endemic disease. It's out there, it's uh, surviving in communities and being passed and uh, living its life cycle outside of China in other countries. All right, let's talk about this superior spreader. Um, This is this one woman infected with coronavirus believed to have infected now 40 people by going to church over here in, how do you pronounce that, Daegu? So this is South Korea. So this this city now has a major problem on its hand. Um, South Korea has now reported 46 new cases of coronavirus and one death. That's in addition to 27 cases yesterday. So look at that increase right there. And um, very sad they have their first death. But let's look at what this means for South Korea really quickly. Here is that city of Daegu down here. We've got Seoul up here. These orange-ish ones. Orange means less than 20 cases. Red mean city with 20 or more cases. So right now, this is where it's clustered, but it's all over the country. Um, 
certainly uh, down this western uh, side here. The U.S. military in South Korea has now banned non-essential travel to and from Daegu for soldiers. Uh, off installation travel is also going to be minimized. So er, put the brakes on uh, getting anything that might be floating around uh, there. The mayor of the city of Daegu it urges – now, this isn't an order yet, but it uh, urges its 2.5 million people to refrain from going outside. And we'll see if that now progresses into a full containment lockdown like we've been seeing in China um, and as well, the city of Daegu is going to delay the start of the school year by at least one week due to coronavirus. We expect that's going to go up. And um, it's the first time in South Korea's history that such a measure has been taken for health reasons. So they're taking it very seriously. Remember yesterday we noted that South Korea is going to begin testing all people who might be suspected of having uh, the disease. So they're taking it very seriously. As well, there was a Navy sailor that tested positive for coronavirus here. This is a South Korean Navy sailor on the southern island of Jeju, tested positive for the new coronavirus. Why is that a problem? Because they're worried that the virus might have spread into military barracks, which is, of course, a very nice contained uh, way for that virus to jump from person to person. So they immediately quarantined this person. He showed symptoms. They got him out of there uh, really quickly. He's now in a hospital. But that's a really concerning development because uh, the question is, how might this person have gotten that and where did it come from? So, uh, again, the epidemiologists are going to be going nuts trying to chase all these things down, particularly if it turns out one person can spread it to 40 or more other people. The plague ship, let's talk about it real quick. We have two fatalities off that, as noted. Um, 27 people from there are now suffering from the coronavirus, seriously ill, uh, 14 of them being Japanese, so 13 of them not. And one is an employee of the Ministry of Health, and the other works at the Cabinet Secretariat, so a bureaucrat. So uh, I guess, so basically not following uh, good protocol and caught this uh, disease. So that's something to, to bear in mind. Now, I just want to talk about the fact that this plague ship also released a lot of people because, of course, they'd been through the incomplete 14-day quarantine period. That's my view. I think that you should quarantine for longer than that. By the way, the word quarantine is uh, derives uh, from an old Italian word, word, and it means 40 days. That's what a quarantine used to mean was when ships would sail into a port before they would allow anybody off the ships because they understood infectious diseases well enough back in the good old, old, old days that they would say, you got to spend 40 days. You, the ship parks, you all spend 40 days there. That's a quarantine. And if you can pass 40 days without being any of you getting sick, you can come ashore. And that's how they used to control things. And part of the reason for that is that you can be cured – but still infectious. So even if you haven't caught the disease or you caught it and, and now you seem to be fine, you can still be infectious. So let's look at some other viruses. Three colors to decode here. First is time you are contagious before symptoms start. So in the norovirus, it might be 10 to 50 hours, you know, maybe up to three days or so, two or three days. You're, you have it, but no symptoms, but you are now actually contagious. And then the red here is time you are contagious after symptoms start. So varying days here for things. And then in the purple, though, is the time it takes before you are not contagious. So this is, um, you know, you might have the symptoms for a while. You might have the symptoms just during this period. But then you still have one to three weeks with norovirus where you could still be contagious. For the rotavirus, stomach flu, things like that, could be one to three weeks, right? Influenza could still be a couple of weeks. A rhinovirus, common cold, could still be a couple of weeks. So as we look through this, this is just part of virology. It's so well understood that it's drawn out with little kid cartoons. Nothing surprising about it. But we're acting as if right now uh, people can be released after they are, quote, cured and, um, and all will be well. I don't know that we can make that assumption. Maybe coronaviruses are different. I don't know. But it doesn't seem likely. All right. I want to talk about something called the fourth turning because this is really important to how all of this plays out. Because what's really essential in a big epidemiological health sort of ministry kind of way is you need – people need to have faith in the institutions that are providing the guidance. The Fourth Turning is a book uh, that I read a while ago by William Strauss and Neil Howe. I've interviewed Neil Howe a couple of times. Fascinating interviews. You can find those at Peak Prosperity. Um, here's the fourth turning, and I'll tell you why I think this really matters in a second. The Strauss-Howe generational theory, also known as the fourth turning theory, or simply the fourth turning, which was created by authors William Strauss and Neil Howe, describes a theorized recurring generational cycle throughout world history. 
According to the theory, historical events are associated with recurring generational personas or archetypes. And each generational persona unleashes a new era. It's called a turning. And each of these lasts about 20 to 22 years in which a new social, political, and economic climate exists. So the full cycle of all four turnings, about 80 years. Here's why it comes into play. The fourth turning, which we're in, according to their model, is termed crisis. And this is an area of destruction. It often involves war or revolution. is accompanied by a profound loss of faith and trust in institutions. And this leads to a breakdown of the established social order, a winter season that precedes a new era of growth and optimism. So I'm actually optimistic because I know you just got to go through winter, but spring always comes. But this profound loss of faith and trust in institutions is really what's marking this period. And it happened even before the coronavirus came along. Remember the yellow vests, all the protests in France, the Hong Kong protests, all these people rising up around the world saying, we don't trust that our interests are neatly aligned with those of the ruling institutions and governing bodies. So where do I see this erosion of trust showing up? Well, it's in things like this. Um, this uh, The health official down in Florida saying, sorry, coronavirus in Florida is a state secret. <clears throat> this is out of the Palm Beach Post, this one. Uh, they are citing the Florida Department of Health cites a patient confidentiality law as the reason not to inform the public. So, you know, what's going on with the coronavirus in Florida? Sorry, you can't find out. It's a secret. Now, that doesn't really sound like it should be a secret, right? So they explained, we are bound by a specific statute and can't release the information. Ah, rules, you know, laws. I'd love to tell you, but, you know, rules, right? That old story, right? So why the secrecy? If a virus that began in China two months ago and has already spread to 28 countries, including the United States, um, don't the people of Florida have a right to be kept in the loop. Of course they do. Of course they do. The state law cited is a passage in the Florida Administrative Code. That sounds official. That says all information contained in laboratory reports, notable, notifiable disease or condition case reports and in related epidemiological investigatory notes is confidential. Well, pretty clear cut, right? But the passage goes on to note three exceptions for releasing otherwise confidential disease or condition case reports to the public. And those exceptions are, one, if the state's health department determines public release of information is warranted due to the highly infectious nature of the disease. Well, that certainly seems to apply here. So they have an out, but they're saying their hands are tied. They don't have an out, which is clearly a fib in this case, which doesn't build trust in this particular institution. Two, if the release of the information would be useful to reduce the potential for further outbreaks. Totally the case. Hey, these people who might have it, they went to school with my kid. I think I'd like to know that. Uh, that would be helpful here. Um, three, if the release helps to identify or locate people in contact with the cases. If one of those conditions is true, it trumps the patient confidentiality requirement. That's how the law is written, but still you see them saying up here, ah, we're bound, we can't release this information, which is clearly it's just a fib. Um, and that erodes trust. Or how about this? I call this the shape of things. This is in an NPR story came out today. They're showing um, these people who, from Americans who are being uh, taken off of the Princess Diamond ship and brought home on a flight. Well, first, this person's wearing a face mask where you can clearly see that the, the that metal band has not been pinched to provide that tight seal. How about even more Hilariously, I, it's just so bad I don't know what to do besides chuckle. Maybe this mask is being worn upside down, providing absolutely zero benefit. So these are people who've been in quarantine. These are people who've been under the care of, of so-called infectious disease experts on that ship. They ought to know by now how you properly put a mask on. I do not for the life of me understand how you could be weeks into this and be doing this. And this is not even explained in the NPR article. They just come forward and put this picture up and tell you about these people being evac. How do you not how do you not notice this stuff, right? Well, now I understand how it was that two Japanese government employees tested positive for coronavirus after working on the cruise ship because maybe they were the ones in charge of helping these people figure out how to put their face masks on. Again, Think of the loss of trust that happens when you're a thinking person, you see this, you connect those dots, and then you think about the so-called public health officials who are supposed to be overseeing this. How do you, how does this build trust? It really doesn't. Or this one, uh, we just found out today that five coronavirus patients are to be transferred to Providence Sacred Heart, 
which is up in Washington State. And this is this is pretty much the entire release in the newspaper said uh, Wednesday evening, Washington State Department of Health released a statement after the Spokane Regional Health District released information about five corona patients who are traveling to Spokane to be treated at the Sacred Heart Medical Center. Department of Health stands ready to support the Spokane Regional Health District. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Wait a minute. We need to know some stuff. The health workers at Sacred Heart and Spokane are trained to offer the safest, highest quality care. To pay. Yeah, but give me some data we can use here. Uh, their special pathogens unit specially equipped to treat patients with infectious diseases as well. It's true. I think they brought in um, Ebola patients a, a long time ago when, when that happened. Uh, they're very highly trained. I get that. We have the highest confidence in the medical professionals assisting with the care and transport for these people. We remain committed. Oh, my God. This is a PR release. What, 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 what would you and I want to know? We'd want to know the ages, gender, race, maybe. Are they from a single family? Were they off of the ship? Were they from Texas? Were they exfilled from China? Did they catch it domestically? What are the diagnoses? Any other contacts and tracing we need to know about? Just, you know, basic information. So it's the withholding of information that leads to that loss of trust and faith. And of course it does, because um, in that vacuum of uh, lack of information is when things, uh, you know, uncertainty is bred. Let's contrast that with Singapore. Look at the Singapore. This is being put out by their Ministry of Health. This just came out recently. So they're looking at as of February 20th. So today, um, looking at this, they're telling you how, look at this data, how many patients have been discharged, how many are still hospitalized, how many in the ICU, what was the longest stay in the hospital, 27 days. That was case number one. Shortest stay in the hospital, case number 76. Hey, let's, oh, here's case number 76. It's an infant. One year old. So, of course, they don't get it at all. Congrat- I'm just so happy about that. That's good news. They tell you about the oldest patient discharge, the oldest, you know, so that tells you it's, it is survivable at this age. They're giving you person with most links to most of the cases. So, you know, here we're looking at how this spreads, possible third degree spread. They've got a case uh, outlined here. Um, number of days with uh, with the greatest number of new cases and the day with the number of uh, greatest number of discharge patients. A lot of data. And total men infected, total women infected. And I'm going to note this as a five to three ratio at this point in time right here, 50 to 34. All right. That means we get to add something here um, in yellow, which is now men are affected at five to three rate compared to women. Could be six to three. I'm not sure, but it's somewhere in that zone. So we'll use that for now. And as we get more data, we'll sharpen that up. But that also means it's very much not like the flu. And as far as I know, not like SARS, um, because I, this uh, gender specificity is, is different. All right, conclusions for today. Japan and Korea now have the coronavirus endemic to their countries and well on their way to being a full-blown epidemic, as this pandemic is now spread across into different localities. The exponential increase, ex-China, still happening. The loss of faith in institutions happens when they withhold information. The fourth turning is a useful frame for understanding this process. I would invite you to either read the book or listen to the uh, podcast I've done with uh, Neil Howe. Just fantastic, really good information. Men, more susceptible than women, by about a five to three uh, ratio here. And But you know what still concerns me the most? Didn't have time to cover it today. Supply chain disruptions and their impacts on a world awash in debt. I think this is going to be the biggest problem for the majority of people. If you come by peak prosperity, we will be talking about that particular piece, especially this weekend. We're really diving in there. That's all for today. Thank you so much for listening. Hi, folks. Adam Taggart here. Chris Martinson and I are the co-founders of Peak Prosperity. If you want to get alerted whenever we release a new video from Chris, just click the red subscribe button right beneath the YouTube video player. Once you've done that, a little bell icon will appear right next to it. Click on that bell. It looks like this. And that's it. The next time we publish a video from Chris, you'll immediately receive a notification from YouTube. Thanks for watching our videos.